Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We will be in the ninth chapter of John this week, so let's just pray and get started. Heavenly Father, again, we come to you thanking you for your word, thanking you for the lessons, thanking you for who you are, and that you sent your son to work his miracles, to show us who he was, and ultimately to show us who you are. So help us, Lord, to believe, increase our faith, Help us to cling to you and love and serve you the way you desire for us to do. Help us to be a witness the way you've called us to be. Father, I pray for our nation. I pray that you will give us godly leaders, that you will help us to be a godly nation and be a light to the world, not to fall to sin, not to fall deeper and deeper away from your will and your ways and your law. Father, forgive us. Use us to bring you glory and honor and forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So tonight we uh, very quickly, very, very briefly, I'm going to just mention a little bit that um, took place between last week's lesson, which ended in chapter eight, verse, um, mm, I don't even know for sure where it is. Anyway, chapter eight. And uh, catch us up to chapter 9, where we begin in, we, we left off in chapter 8, verse 18 last week. And we will begin in chapter 9, verse 24 this week. So, Jesus was in Jerusalem. It was the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. He was teaching on the temple grounds. That's where we left him. It says that he was beginning to have believers, people come to believing in him. And there are a couple of verses that I just want to to uh to mention and then that's all I'm going to do for the rest of chapter 8. Ver chapter 8 verse 31 and 32. He was talking to the ones that were becoming his believers and he said, "If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you hold to my teachings, then you are mine and you will know the truth." and the truth will set you free. These were Jews. They didn't understand what he was talking about, setting them free. They're like, we're children of Abraham. We've never been slaves. You're not talking to, you know, there were many, many pilgrims there. Slaves could participate in this, in this festival. And they said, but we're children of Abraham. We've never been slaves. We don't need to be set free. And Jesus explains to them, that they need to be set free from sin and that he is the son of God. He is the living water, the bread of life, all of those things, and that he can save them and set them free from that sin. That the fact that they are descendants of Abraham has nothing to do with their bondage to sin. So the rest of that chapter is just some banter back and forth, as we've seen already between Jesus and the and the Jews. The resentment for him is growing much stronger. Then we get into chapter 9, and the first 23 verses of chapter 9 are about a story of Jesus healing a blind man. This was a blind man that had been blind from birth. Again, the kicker, one of the kickers in this story is that it is the Sabbath. This is probably the last day of that Feast of Tabernacles, and it is a Sabbath. Just like he had healed the man by the pool of Bethesda, he is going to heal a blind, the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda. He's going to heal a blind man here by this pool of Siloam. And so, as they are walking past and they see this blind man, he's been blind from birth, the disciples see an opportunity to ask Jesus a question and to learn something. And so they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that caused him to be blind from birth? Well, your first thought, or at least my first thought would be, how can this man who's been blind from birth sin and cause his blindness? It was common for them to believe that afflictions were caused by sin. So if the parents had sinned, in this case, it would have had to have been the parents because he was blind from birth. If the parents had sinned, that sin was on him, was visiting him. There's a place where it talks about the sin visiting for several generations. But 
who sent him or his parents. And I think it also shows us some of these lingering influences. Remember, the Greek Empire had been in control of this area before the Roman Empire. And some of our philosophers, such as Plato and, and some of the others, had this belief, this philosophy that, that our souls were present and alive prior to our bodies being born. And that souls were, I don't know, some of, the, some of them thought different things, but that our souls were out there just kind of waiting around to find a body to be embodied in and to be born. And so the soul could sin, the spirit, the soul could sin before it was born. And so that might have even played into to their thinking here. But it was common thinking, even in Judaism, to believe that sins caused affliction. And so Jesus wants to set all of this straight. And he says, no one's sin is responsible for this man's blindness. This man is blind because it's going to give an opportunity for God to be glorified. So I think we have to realize and, and think about that sin, even though sometimes sin does bring about affliction. I mean, people who, um, there are sexual situations and diseases and things that take place and, and maybe, you know, literally some sins do have repercussion and, and they do cause affliction. But Jesus is saying affliction is an opportunity for God to be glorified. And we're going to talk about the different ways that that can happen. So after he explains this and says it's neither the parents nor him, but it's an opportunity for God to be glorified, he spits on the ground, makes a little bit of mud, smears it on the man's eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool. And when he returns, he can see. He can see. The blind man can see. So everyone who knew him said, wow, this is the guy that sits and begs out by the pool. He's been blind all of his life and he can now see. And others were saying, oh, there's no way. That's impossible. No one's ever been healed from birth of blindness. But so they're kind of divided. But he said, the man steps up and he says, I am the man. And yes, that's what happened. So they ask him, how did it happen? And so he tells them exactly what Jesus had done. And they said, well, where is this Jesus? And he says, I don't know. He'd gone, probably gone back home. And he says, I don't know. I don't know where he is. And so they take him to the Pharisees, to the temple, to the temple grounds, whatever. They take him to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees ask him what happened. So he tells his story again. This poor man tells his story over and over and over. So he tells them again. And the Pharisees are, of course, very indignant. And they say, this can't be a man of God. He's, this man is a sinner. He's healed on the Sabbath. Who would heal on the Sabbath? And so they, you know, this, this just can't be, you know, a thing from God. And then others were saying, well, <laughs> there's no normal man, no normal sinner that could do a miracle like this. So they're very divided. And they finally send for the man's parents. They bring the man's parents in and they ask them three questions. They said, is this your son? Was he blind from birth? And how does he now see? So the parents respond, yes, we know this is our son. Second question, yes, we know that he was blind from birth. Third question, we don't know. We do not know how he now sees. And the scripture tells us that they said, he's a grown man. He's of age. He's a grown man. You ask him. He can tell you. And it says that they were afraid because the Pharisees had said that anyone who acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, would be thrown out of the synagogue. And to be thrown out, to be cast out of the synagogue was very serious. Worship was a part of their lives. It was part of their social standing. You you had to do certain sacrifices and do certain things, certain pilgrimage. And, and if you were cast out, you couldn't do those things. So how would you gain favor with God? And socially, that's where people met. That's where they gathered. That's where decisions were made. So it was, it was very serious to be thrown out of the synagogue. And so this is where we leave this story and, and enter today's lesson. The parents answer, yes, he's our son. Yes, he's been blind from birth. 
we don't know how he was healed. And of course, they're afraid that if they said, he told us, or we believe that Jesus did it, that they would be thrown out of the synagogue. So that's where our lesson starts today in verse 37 of chapter 9. I mean, in chapter uh, 20. Verse, I'll get it right in a minute. Verse 24 of chapter 9. So a second time, they summonsed the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. So the Pharisees are refusing to accept any part of Jesus' role in this healing. They, they do not want to accept any part of Jesus' role in the healing. They don't want to acknowledge the miracle. And they certainly do not want to acknowledge Jesus as God's son or as Messiah. And so they say, just go ahead and give glory to God by telling the truth. Say that God just healed you, but Jesus didn't have anything to do with it. Just give glory to God, but just don't bring this Jesus guy into it. And so then uh, they said, we know this man's a sinner. They're back to that discrediting, take away the validity of the situation, discredit him. No credit to go to Jesus. In verse 25, he, the man, replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I love his response. I love the way he responds to them. He wasn't timid. He, he had confidence. I mean, you've been blind all of your life, and suddenly this man puts some spit and dirt on your eyes, and you can see he has confidence in Jesus. He has confidence in what has happened to him. And he says, you know, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. Not my job to judge that. But what I do know is that I was blind and now I see. I was blind and now I see. You can say whatever you want to, but it doesn't change the facts. The facts are I was a blind man and I am no longer blind. And Jesus is the one that did it. And no matter what you do or what you say or how you act cannot change those facts. So very bravely, he stood up and told them what had happened and how he felt. Then in verses 26 through 29, then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are his fall you are his followers, disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. So they again say, Tell us again, tell us again. I maybe they wanted to find some fault in his story. Maybe his story wouldn't be consistent. Some loophole that they could find. So he said, tell us again what happened. Just tell us again. He says, I've told you and you didn't listen. So the man does not tell them again. And then he gets pretty sassy, actually, considering these are the Jewish leaders. He gets agitated. He gets kind of sassy. And he says, I've told you already. Why? Do you want to become his disciple? Are you so interested in this so you can become his disciples? Oh, that ticked him off. That that really made them angry. I mean, their anger, their resentment, their rage, their jealousy toward Jesus has been building all along. And so these situations are just adding fuel to the fire. And so they hurled insults at him. You're his followers' disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We're going back to our heritage. You can be. You're one of his disciples. So they're discrediting this man now. And then he go, they go on and they say, we know that God spoke to Moses. We don't even know where this guy's from. You know, I don't know why they, several times, several times they go, we don't even know where he's from. Well, they knew he was from Galilee. That's been stated. Why didn't they just ask him, where were you born? Because if they knew the scripture and they knew the prophecy, they knew that Messiah would come from Bethlehem. So why didn't they just ask him where he was born instead of just using that as an excuse to just slough him off and say, we don't know where this guy's from. We know God spoke to Moses. We know where Moses was. We don't even know where this guy's from. 
and they refer to him as this fellow, this man. They never speak the name of Jesus. They never speak the name. It was no secret where he was from. If they'd asked him, they might, he might have answered them and told them. So this fellow, as they refer to him, they will not speak the name of Jesus. Hatement and resentment just building. This previously blind man can evidently see much more than just the first glimpses of the world around him. Imagine he, he is blind. Jesus puts some muddy dirt in his eyes. He goes down to this pool and he rinses them off. And he looks around and sees the world for the first time. But I think he's seen much more than that. This man that's been blind could see through his heart, through the vision of his mind, and understand things that maybe a seeing person might not have even caught on to. This man sees way more than just the world around him. So listen to his bold testimony and his confrontation of these Jews in verses 30 through 33. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody ever heard of opening the eyes of a man blind, born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So here this man who's certainly uneducated, who's probably spent his life begging by this pool, lays out a case like a skilled lawyer. And he, he, I love the way he, you know, he got a little sassy back over here in these other verses. And in this verse, he's, he's almost going, hmm, isn't that interesting? That's just remarkable that you don't even know where he's from. You, the religious leaders of the city, don't even know where this man who performs these miracles is from. But yet he opened my eyes. The most impressive person that's been through here ever, and you don't even know where he's from. But he opened my eyes. Very, very contradictory. Hmm, that's remarkable that you, the bigwigs, don't even know where he's from. And then he goes on to repeat something that they've already said and use it against him. Well, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly. Evidently, he must, Jesus must be godly because God certainly listened to him and he healed me. And by the way, y'all are supposed to be godly. Nobody ever heard of opening eyes of someone who was born blind. Maybe someone who was injured and they recovered their sight. And they did. I mean, they had the most modern medicine of the, of the day in the Roman Empire. Maybe there were some situations with eye infection or something that they healed and, and someone recovered their sight. But no one's ever heard of anyone gaining their sight that was born blind. And especially, he's a grown man after all these years. So, if this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. So he has turned the tables on these Jews. These poor Jews, bless their heart, every time they turn around, someone is trapping them in their own, their own things that they say, in their own law, and in their own way of expressing themselves and turning the tables on them. They were supposed to be godly. Why didn't God respond to them? Why couldn't they heal? And you know, Jesus usually, very often, he does things that can't be explained. Things that, like this man, that medicine could not have done. But Jesus did, through the power of God. So he points out their irony, he points out their hypocrisy, and says, just isn't that remarkable? And then in verse 34, to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. <laughs> now they began to attack this man's credibility. The, the fact that he could see and that everybody knew that he was blind from birth, how do you even, how do you attack that? But they just pull a power play. They can't argue. They can't win the argument. And so they just throw him out. 
end of discussion. How dare you talk to us? We're, we're the upper crest. How dare you talk to us like that? We're the spiritual leaders. And you, look at you. You were blind since birth. Sin, 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 sin caused that. How dare you talk to us? But you know, this man is just witnessing to what he knew. He's just saying, here's the change that Jesus brought in my life. I don't know anything about him. All I know is that he gave me sight. And I'm just telling you. I'm just witnessing to what I know. And you know, that's what we're supposed to do. As Christians, that's what we're supposed to do. God does not call us to do some quote doctrine or expound on things. He just calls us to witness to what we know the Lord has done in our lives. There's a Christian song out that I absolutely love, and there's a line in it that says, I could have had a really different story. This blind man would have had a really different story had Jesus not come by. I would have had a really different story had Jesus not come into my life. You would have had a really, really different story had Jesus not come into your life. And if Jesus hasn't come into your life, if he hasn't, if you haven't invited him into your life and submitted to him, you can have a different story, a much better story, a story that lasts for eternity. You can have that story. So the man was just testifying to what he knew. That's what we're supposed to do. Just testify to what we know. If you go into a court of law, as a witness, the only thing that you can testify to is what you know, not what you speculate, what you think you know, what you heard, only to what you know. And that's what this man did. And that is what we're supposed to do as witnesses for our Savior. So verse 37, <clears throat> excuse me, at verse 35 through 36, excuse me, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus goes and he finds this man. If you remember a few weeks ago when he healed the man, by the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda, he went back later and he found him. And the conversation was a little different. He told the man that he had healed by the pool of Bethesda. He says, change your life. Change your life of sin. Or something even worse could happen to you. This man, he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And this man is so humble. And he says, oh, sir, just tell me about him so that I can believe. That's the humble hearts we're supposed to have. Be ready to take that step of faith when Jesus finds us. He finds us. When our hearts are ready, when we're, he comes to us. He convicts our hearts. He speaks to our hearts. And we just have to be ready to take that step, that step of faith. And he comes to us. Just like he seeks, he sought this man. He found this man. Goes back to him. And he comes back to tug on our hearts too. Verse 37, Jesus tells him exactly who the Son of Man is. Son of Man is Jesus' most common way of referring to himself as Messiah. The connection between God and man. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. And Jesus says, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. He had restored his sight. You're now looking at him. You see him. I'm him. He could have just said, I am he, and left it at that. He wanted this man to have no doubt. He said, you have seen him. Here I stand. And he's the one speaking with you. And the last verse is the response of this man. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The man accepted this healer as much, much more than just that fellow 
that had put some mud on his eyes. He reverenced him. He, he revered him. He believed in him. He worshiped him. He bowed down to him. He committed himself. He submitted himself to him. So let me point out just a few little things that as a review to this lesson. Number one, what is a witness? We're all called to be witnesses. We are called to be witnesses as Christians because we need to keep the cycle going. Someone witnessed to us and we were saved and we need to witness to others so they could be saved, so they can witness to others and they can be saved. It should be generational. It should be every, it, it should multiply because we witness and then the ones we witness to witness. But what is a witness? They can only attest to what they know. So don't ever think that you've got to know a bunch, that you've got to be able to quote all of this stuff and you've got to be learned. The only thing you need to do is to be able to tell people the change that Jesus made in your life. And if you can't tell them that, you need to do some of that self-inspection that we taught about last week. If you can't do that, you need some self-inspection. Be a witness to what Jesus has done in your life. The second thing is why? Why is affliction present? We see things that are horrible. Why are children blind? Why do children have cancer? Why do accidents happen and innocent families are killed by a drunk driver? Jesus said that day, this affliction, this pain, is so that the Father can be glorified. So through pain, through affliction, through illness, through all of these things that are brought on because we sinned in the first place, there was no pain, there was no affliction in the Garden of Eden. But we sinned against God, and that brought it about. But it happens, and it brings God glory. It's an opportunity to bring God glory. It's an opportunity to bring God glory through healing. We should not credit modern medicine or doctors for healing. God gave us the knowledge, gave us the skill. It's all from God. He's the great physician. So give God the credit. Give him the glory for healing. No matter who it's through, whether it's divine or through a doctor in the hospitals, it's still God's healing. He gets glory through how we handle the affliction. When we have something in our life that hurts, when we have an illness, when something goes wrong, how we handle it, do we still give him glory and honor? Do we still witness for him? Like Job, do we still, even though Job had his times of struggle, Job gave God glory and said, I'm not turning my back on God just because these reflections are on me. We give glory to God through how we handle those afflictions. And third, we give glory to God through ministering to people in affliction. You know, I've had breast cancer. So when someone else has breast cancer, I can identify with them and say, you can come out of this, you can come through this. It hurts, it's scary, it's terrifying. But you can come through this and you can still praise and give God the glory. And then last but certainly not least, just knowing Jesus and knowing what he does is not enough. We have to believe in him. We have to believe in the one who sent him and that results in worship, making him number one in our lives. We cannot worship him in second or third or fifth or tenth place. He has to be first place in our lives. So we worship him, we submit to him, we become obedient to him, and we tell others so that they can do the same thing and they can tell others. That's our lesson from the blind man beside the pool, that Jesus healed and restored his sight. He can restore sight in our eyes, but he can restore sight in our hearts. Jesus is the healer. Thank you so much.